Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're just waiting for all of the participants to join us and then we'll get the webinar underway. We just give everybody a, just a, one more minute for, for people to join. Welcome everybody. Just give you just a, another few seconds for a few more people to join and then we'll get on to way. Okay. Hello everybody and welcome to our webinar today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your morning to come and join us. We really hope that this will be a, a helpful session for you all. Um, we are going to be recording the session and our session will be up on our website. So we'll send out a link to everybody and a copy of the presentations will also be made available. So don't worry about taking notes or if you've missed anything. Um, my name is Tara Chatterway and I am Head of Education at Thomas Pocklington Trust and I also manage our student support service. Um, and today we are really delighted to be joined by uh, University of York to talk about all things university. So how you can get your support in place if you're going to university in this September or maybe you're going next year and you just want to get ahead of the curve. And they're going to, Mo and Alice are both going to talk you through some of the support that's provided by York University, but also some of the general support that you might, you might expect from any university that you go to. We have both our chat function and the Q&A function open. So please do, if you've got any questions, don't hold them to the end, just put them in. And um, myself and Alex Henderson from the student support team will be monitoring and we'll put them to the panelist at the end. Um, we're a small group, so so please do ask questions. Don't be afraid to, to ask that question because there's probably somebody else that's wanting to ask it as well. There's no silly question at this stage. We only know, you only know what you know, don't you? Which is probably not that much about all of the support that's available when you go to university because it's so very different to, to college or, or school support. Um, and at the end also, I'll tell you a little bit about our student support service and the support that's on available to you. So if you do have any questions after the presentation um, about any support that you're looking for, questions about the universities that you're looking to go, go for, our, our service should be able to, to help you. So I'm going to be quiet now and close off and hand over to Mo from uh, the university who will be able to start the presentation. So welcome Mo. Hi, I'm Mo, as Tara said, um, from the University of York. I'm a student advisor, so I work within the student support and advice team at the university. And one of the uh, main things I do is act as a um, dedicated contact for disabled students regarding all things student support. Um, so that's really why I'm here. And I'm going to be talking you through some of the things that you might need to do before you start university. I think we have got some slides. I don't know whether that's shared at the moment. There we go, sorry. Just get those sorted out. 
So I'm going to be talking through, as I said, some of the things that you might need to do before you start university. Things like getting reasonable adjustments in place, any specialist equipment that you might need, and also financial support at university. A few other things as well. And then I'm going to be handing over to my colleague Alice to tell you a bit more about accessing library services and about digital accessibility. I often say to people that disabled students and disabled people in general have a lot of extra things that we need to do before we go about any particular task. And before going to university, I've worked out that disabled students have at least five extra appointments prior to going to university compared with other students. And that's really because we tend to have things to think about that other students might just be able to sort out as they go along. So it's worth spending a bit of time getting things sorted out before coming to university because that's going to help in terms of being able to settle into your course when you get here. So I'm going to talk through things uh, that we can do at the University of York, but also talk quite generally about the things you need to go, do for going to university. So if we move on to our next slide, I'm going to talk about um, some of the reasonable adjustments that you might need to put in place for academic support. Um, if you're planning to go to university this year, then you should have already applied for your student finance and disabled student allowances. If you haven't, it's worth getting that in place now. Applying for disabled students allowances can take time. Um, I think we've got a slide about uh, the disability services, Alice, I don't know. There we go. Um, it can take a bit of time. So if you are coming to university this year and you haven't done this already, it's worth starting now. But if, even if you're coming to university next year or at some point in the future, it's worth knowing that this process needs to be started early. The application itself is really quick because you can do it online, but you will have to find a bit of evidence um, to demonstrate what your additional needs might be. It's fairly quick, as I said, to apply, but you'll have to do things like booking an assessment, which will enable you to meet with a specialist um, advisor to talk through any equipment that you might find helpful and any support that you might need from another person to make your time at university possible and also to go smoothly. So it's all those extra things through disabled students allowance that you can access to help you to access the course you want to do. And then even after the assessment that you've had, you will still have things to do relating to that, such as ordering equipment and getting in-person support in place. And most universities do have a person or a team that can help you to get that support sorted out. So it's worth getting in touch with them as well early on. Um, do talk to the disability services or equivalent at the university you want to go to. We will talk to disabled students before coming to university. So even if you're just at the stage of exploring where you might want to go, please do get in touch with the disability team and have a chat about what sorts of things are going to be possible. If you're going to be receiving particular software or equipment through things like disabled students allowances, you'll also need to put some training in place um, on how to use that effectively. So again, that's an extra appointment that you might need to have to get things sorted out before coming to university. So at York, our disability services team have disability practitioners who, in addition to helping you with the disabled students allowance process, which is done through your student finance provider, usually Student Finance England, Wales or Northern Ireland or Student um, Awards Agency for Scotland. So our disability practitioners can do things like put a student support plan in place as well, which will set out any additional requirements you have 
and any reasonable adjustments that can be put in place by the university. So that might be extra time in exams. It might be if you need to sit in a particular place in a lecture room to set up equipment, or if you have any digital accessibility requirements or accessibility requirements relating to using the library. And obviously Alice is gonna talk about those in, in more detail uh, in a little while. But there may be things that you can get involved in as well before coming to university, such as early induction programmes. At York, we have our Step Ahead induction programme, which is for students to get a little bit of an idea about some of the um, extra support that you can get at university. And also just getting yourself acquainted with some of the things you might need to know before you arrive. So it's worth getting that student support plan or equivalent sorted out even before then so your accessibility requirements can be made available to those who are running those sorts of programmes as well as getting them in place for your course when you actually start. So some of you might need orientation support in advance of the beginning of term as well. So again, another reason to get in touch with disability practitioners, either at York or the university that you're going to and do that as soon as possible if you haven't done already and then we can try and put some support in place and if I've um, said things today that you hadn't thought of before but you've already got in touch with the disability services at the university you're going to please do get back in touch with them and, and have a chat about it now rather than waiting until the start of term. So I'll just tell you a little bit more about the general support that's available as well at university. If we move on to the next slide. Thanks. I've just put some key points on the slide really of the things that we're able to help with. Um, I work within our student support and advice team, as I said at the beginning, um, rather than within our disability services team. So my job really relates to kind of all the other aspects of student life um, rather than the academic things. Although I do help where students need to make significant adjustments to the way that they access their course. Um, but for the most part, it's the nicer kind of general life stuff that I tend to be involved in. Just trying to make your time at university um, a bit more easily accessible and enjoy enjoyable really. So in addition to sorting out all those things um, to be able to access your studies and finding your way around the campus, most universities have departments like our student support and advice team who can help with other aspects of student life. And those things tend to include addressing any problems with student finance or applying for it in the first place, planning your budget for coming to university, so working out what you might need um, to live on and then what income you can get. So we can also help with getting any benefits in place that you might be entitled to, things like personal independence payment. Um, what happens at age 16 is often people do transfer onto personal independence payment from disability living allowance. And so we find that sometimes that's not quite sorted out when you're getting ready to come to uni. So you can talk to an advisor about that. And also universal credit as well, because disabled students can apply for that, but it can be a little bit complicated to sort it out. So we're here to help with things like that. And then also students might need a bit of extra help with daily living activities, especially if you haven't lived independently before. So you might not know what it is you need help with uh, until you try it. So it's possible to ask for an assessment from your local social services before you come to university because they might be able to suggest things, they might be able to provide support or equipment. So it's a good idea to have a chat with them. Um, and obviously that's something I can help with as well in terms of talking through the sorts of things you can ask for. And in addition to that, uh, myself and the student support and advice team put on events and activities throughout the year for students. Um, we run things like the Step Ahead induction, but we also do other activities such as social events and craft activities. 
and some of the nice things, just trying to build a bit of community. So that's not just disabled students, that will be um, students from the other sorts of groups that we support specifically, like student carers as well. Um, and so some people might cross several of those groups too. So we do try to do a little bit of community building at York uh, and other universities are doing similar things as well. So it's a nice idea to have a look at what other things you can get involved in before you come to university. One of the things we also do that can be useful is a buddying programme, which is open to any student at university. But we do try to match students with somebody who might have had a similar experience. So that can be especially useful um, if you're a little bit apprehensive about coming to uni and living independently. So I'm going to hand over to Alice now to tell you a little bit more about the library and IT services side of things. Right, so I'll just unmute myself. Um, so I'm going to talk you through essentially what we do at York. It is going to be an overview because there's lots and lots of different variants and caveats on this. And I'll talk a little bit as to kind of how things work um, overall in higher education with this. But there is a lot of variation. So do ask questions and I'll try to answer those as best I can. But the way different universities are set up around where disability support sits in regard to library and IT varies a lot. Um, so some of this will be slightly generic simply because of the huge amount of variation. So just to start off with uh, disability students allowance, which um, Mo um, can you know help with the applications for and so on, there is support for that. So if you do think you're eligible and you, and you do want to apply, do speak to people about that. Most of the assistive software that our students uh, use is from DSA. And DSA assessments are fantastic in that they will do something very specific and bespoke for you and about what works for you. The training is usually supplied by them as well. The issue with that is it means we have students using lots of very specific systems and lots of very different systems. So in terms of institutional IT support, we're not always able to support the specialist software that you might have from DSA. We will have some more generic assistive software that we can provide if you have a problem. Um, so if your uh, laptop provided by the DSA breaks, we might be able to lend you something, support you um, in that gap. But we can only offer very limited sort of best effort support for most of the specialist software. Um, to some extent, this is true of most institutions, not our, uh, there are so many different kind of very specific bits of tech that you could be provided with. Um, so getting the DSA stuff in place is really important for making sure that it's absolutely in place for you, but it is um, going to be primarily supported through the DSA. Um, this should all be covered in your student support plan. Um, do talk to your department or IT if there are delays in this, because sometimes the training takes a while or sometimes somebody's device will break. We might be able to loan something to you. Um, that's something we can do at York. Uh, so that there are variations there with uh, what's right. The other thing is also to have a look at what your university provides in terms of assistive software, um, because a lot of us have got some licenses for things and there are also a lot of features that people don't really make full use of in lots of programs. Um, so depending on what you've used before and depending on what subject you're doing, you might want to have a word with somebody in IT or in disability support about what might also be available. And just have a go with a few different bits of software to find what works for you. Um, it's something you might have in conjunction with the SA software, but having a few things, quite a few of our students find that having different bits of software and different devices is quite good because it gives them approaches to different kinds of things. Um, so it's something to, to have a look at and be aware of. With the library resources, and this does tie back to the software, because there are so many uh, variants of software, there isn't a kind of magic bullet of files or accessibility. So we do different things around that. In terms of physical library resources, um, we have slightly longer term loans and slightly longer um, return periods um, for books for students with adjusted services. Um, we have um, a very odd um, library system, which is an offshoot of Dewey. Um, and you quite often end up with very long shelf marks, sort of letter number combinations. And these can be quite confusing um, and they can often be difficult to read. So if you are struggling to locate items in the library and collect items directly from the shelves, 
we can add a collection status to your account. So you can request items to collect directly from the whole shelf. Um, this can be helpful for some of our students. Or if you do have someone else to collect items on your behalf, we can add nominated collection um, as well, which means someone else can collect the books for you. Um, similar things are in place in different universities. Again, that's York specific. I can't uh, speak to everywhere. In terms of assisting reading, um, we have multifunction printers and they all have a scanning function. And you can scan to uh, an OCR PDF and that will email to your university account for free. So if you are using PDF readers and so on, that's something to look at um, with magnification software and so on as well. Um, it can be a lot easier than using um, text directly in the library as well. Similarly, we've got some stocks of pastel paper available at the help desk. Um, some people find that much easier to read from than a white uh, paper background. And we also have Erlen overlays to lend out in the library if you're working with physical texts as well. There's also a census file conversion, uh, which you may have used before. And this enables you to create or convert accessible files, um, including for audio files. It is slightly a blunt instrument. It's not the most um, nuanced of file conversion uh, services, but it is free and it is there for you to use for your own work, um, as well as um, transferring any files that you need to on it. Another thing to be aware of with that is we use a, a VLE system, a virtual learning environment, and those are common to most universities. And we use Blackboard, which is, again, a very common one that's used across all sorts of universities. And there is a function within that called Blackboard Ally, and it means you can access documents that have been uploaded to Blackboard in different formats. It gives you the choice of how you want to download that. So you can use EPUB software, you can um, do things by accessible PDF and so on. So we find this is quite useful if people are using a PDF reader or things like that, that it gives them the option, no matter what a, an academic has uploaded something in. So being aware of different file types and what kind of conversion options are available to you is, is quite a useful thing with text as well. So the adjusted library services, I think have I uh, yeah, there we go, I skipped one. The Adjusted Library Services, we also offer for print impaired students alternative format service. Now, what we will do is your reading list from your department, anything that is marked as an essential reading, we will create an accessible file for. Um, we find this saves lots of time. Mo was mentioning um, sort of extra appointments and things that essentially being able to deliver to you your essential readings directly will save you time. Unfortunately, the way online library catalogues work is often not terribly accessible with screen readers. Um, so for each of those, we will create an accessible PDF and RTF file, or if you've told us that you only want one of those, we can do that. Again, no magic bullet, but we find that if we provided both of those, at least one will usually work with most screen reading or magnification software. Um, and we can do this for printed or online material from the library collections. Um, so if a chapter has been um, set for your class and possibly it's an online um, ebook um, and the site may not be very accessible, this is a problem with e-publishers, we can create an accessible file and we will effectively create a Dropbox in a shared Google Drive for you. So you can collect that straight from uh, your drive. Um, we'll do that for everything that's marked as a key reading on your reading list. But if you are a research student, if you're doing an essay, if you're doing your dis uh, dissertation at the end of um, your undergraduate degree, you can uh, email us and we will digitise other texts to support your essay writing and research. Um, so there, there are options there. Some of our online texts are um, accessible already. There is a big problem at the moment in academic publishing, and this is true for all of um, higher education, about the cost of ebook provision and also around accessibility, um, in that library ebooks are different to commercial ebooks. So you might be able to see something is available as a Kindle on Amazon for £10, and there might not be a digital library edition existing, so we might not be able to get it at all, um, or it might cost £100 for something that's £10 in print um, or as a Kindle. The pricing is quite problematic. Adding to that then the accessibility issues in that some will let you download a chapter as a PDF, which is great if you use a PDF reader or magnification software. Some of them don't let you do that. 
Some of them have more accessibility features than others. It's quite variable. This is something we are aware of. It is a problem across the sector, but this is partly why we will create these accessible files because we know even if there is an online copy, it doesn't mean that it's accessible for you. We have a specific team who um, do this alternative format service. It is reliant on us getting the information from your department. So as Mo was saying, that meeting with talking to different people is important. Your department need to know. It should be part of your student support plan. But again, making sure that everybody involved in this is aware is important. As I said, different institutions do have different mechanisms. So um, some institutions, disability support sits with the library. Other institutions, it sits very separately. York is quite um, decentralised. We've got very independent departments, uh, which is great because they all feel quite um, like they've got their own sort of sense of personality, but it can be a bit difficult because they don't all behave the same way. Um, so different universities work in very different ways. There will be some mechanism for providing this for you. So I can tell you about what we do. I can tell you about what some other universities in um, the North of England do um, from conferences and things, but it should be raised with you as part of your student support plan. If it hasn't been mentioned to you, contact your prospective department, contact the library. There will be some plan in place um, and it should be raised with you. I can't say for certain what it will be, but there will be some kind of provision. And just an, a final point, which would be for any of these adjusted library services at York, you need to be registered with disability services. You don't need to be in receipt of DSA. Um, it's likely that you would want to apply for DSA and would be eligible for it, but we find a few things such as if you are resident outside the UK, you can't apply for DSA, where there are some problems around international students with it. Um, and some people find it just very difficult to apply for and don't want to. That's totally fine. But if you are in that situation or you know someone else's, it doesn't mean you can't access university disability support. It doesn't mean that you can't access the adjusted library services. We just need to have you referred from our own disability services. We don't require you to be in receipt of DSA. Um, so you're still eligible for all the university support, even if you're not getting that external support um, as well. And I think that brings us to any questions. I was quite a quick overview, but again, not knowing what people quite wanted to know and not being able to speak to the um, exact things of other universities um, means that there. So we've got our email addresses there. So, I mean, hopefully there's some questions now. Um, if after the fact you think of lots of questions that you would like to ask us, do feel free to drop either of us a, an, an email and um, that's fine, but hopefully there are some questions. I don't know. Um, hi guys, yeah, it's Alex here from the Student Support Service. So actually it looks a bit like you guys have covered everything because we've got no questions from what I can see. I don't know, Tara or Penny, if you've, you're seeing any. Um, hello, hi everybody. It's, it's Tara Chattering here. Apologies, I've just had to move room. So I've just missed the last couple of minutes of the, the presentation because uh, builders across the road decided to pick out a very noisy saw, which is great at timing. Um, I, can't, I can't see any questions, but please, any questions you can raise your um, hand put them in the q a um or into to the chat box i can see one question has just come up so we'll just let give alex a, a moment to, to um to read that and then um shortly give you a bit of an overview as well about what uh, support is is available for our service as well so over to you alex okay So um, Max has said, does each university have its own disability practitioner? Most universities do. Um, and it's usually a team of people who um, it's usually called disability services, but you may find um, various different things such as um, disability resource centers, or um, I'm trying to think what some of the, the others sort of enabling services, things like that. They all have slightly different um, titles. But usually, if you look on a university website and look up disability, um, that you will find um, information about the disability practitioners or their equivalents, um, sometimes called advisors. But there's usually um, a dedicated person or team at each university. There is, um, I'm trying to think, whether there's an easy way of finding out who they are. Um, I'm not sure whether there is, to be honest. I think it's contacting each individual university because they do things quite differently. 
And you would find that um, places such as Oxford and Cambridge might do things a little bit differently than um, other Russell Group universities or other universities generally. Yeah, absolutely. Disability officers is another one that is dif disability support. Disability services is usually the one I would search for disability services as a first stop. Um, but yeah, universities all like to differentiate themselves from each other and they like to use different names for things. And also people get their job titles changed quite frequently as well. So I would search for disability services, but as Mo said, I mean, disability officer, disability practitioner, have a look. It, the support will be there. There will be somebody with that job, but we can't guarantee what they'd be called. Okay, so we've got another question from Beth. Um, she says, I'm 64, am I too old? No, <laughs> so, no, um, I mean, we have loads of mature students and um, that's, that's absolutely fine. Um, you know, if, if you want to come in and study with us, that's, that's great. Um, that's not a problem at all. <laughs> so, yep, there's, there's no age limit. And that's the same for disabled students allowance as well. There's, it, it's to support you through university. So it's there for um, undergraduates, postgraduates, and there's, there's no age, age cap on it at all. So the same support will be, be for everybody. Yeah. There are some nuances when it comes to student finance. So again, there's likely to be a money, money advisor in each university um, who does a similar job to me. Um, and you can find them on the National Association of Student Money Advisors website. There is a contact um, link where you can find the department within the university that advise on student finance. Okay, great. Um, so Ian says, what can prospective students, what, sorry, what, <laughs> what can prospective students expect to help them to be more socially included outside of the academic um, things at university? Um, well, one thing that I do at the minute is this, I mean, obviously COVID has affected everything hugely. And um, one of the things that has affected is an awful lot of the kind of social events, particularly those put on by departments. Um, so we have found that departments have been trying to run quite a few social events online. The accessibility of those has been pretty variable, I'll be honest. Um, and I keep popping up like a little accessibility gremlin and telling people you can't do that, it's not accessible with things. We are trying to encourage them to do things in multiple formats, including um, the social things, because we don't want people to be excluded. So um, from um, a sort of digital point of view, from my point of view with departments, that's where we are. The Student Union um, has disability offices and is very good about inclusivity. Um, so certainly at York, they're very big on making sure that um, their stuff is inclusive. Um, and Mo, I think you can probably speak to some of the support you offer and, and networks you have there with the um, outside academic stuff. Yeah, I mean, in terms of anything specific for sort of disabled students or students who are visually impaired, it varies massively between each different university as to what we might offer for particular students but then the students unions do make a huge effort to make their events accessible as well as university events um, and if you do have access questions usually student unions um, are pretty good on knowing uh, about each of the societies and, and what should be put in place and what can be put in place um, and if you have any issues with that, again, disability practitioners within the university, if it's something to do with events that are being offered outside of, of you know, the classroom, etc., then, you know, they can help. Advisors like myself can help as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, realistically, <laughs> you should expect events to be accessible. OK, excellent. Thanks, guys. Um, Lauren says, I'm considering getting a guide dog um, for university. To what extent will the, the university be accessible for guide dogs? Um, I would just say there's a potential. Um, could you tell us what subject you're planning to do? Because the only awareness I have that there's been a problem with guide dogs is if people want to take them into labs. Um, 
so chemistry labs are and some of the biology labs and physics labs and things can be problematic so if you're planning to do chemistry then possibly there would be some issues in terms of taking an assistance dog into lectures into the library buildings things like that that's not a problem Hist oh well absolutely fine history doesn't have chemical labs so you're you're absolutely fine with that and that should be fine um so there was a recent case where an assistance dog in the US had to have a, a suit built for it and there was an accessibility suit um, with a literal suit for the dog, which is quite amazing over technical labs. So I, I am aware that, um, I mean, partly for a health and safety thing and partly for, for the sake of the assistance dog, really, that was. But um, if you're not using labs, I'm not really aware of any problems. You would need to contact accommodation. Um, so there would potentially be... Um, a need to have a conversation with accommodation if you wanted to live on campus um that they would need to work with that but i mean i've um had colleagues there was a colleague with a hearing dog um and she was doing medieval studies and um reggie the little hearing dog went everywhere in medieval studies it was completely fine registered assistance dogs are not a problem um in most university buildings there are specific rules about um what needs to be provided as well in terms of exercise areas for guide dogs and um, you know it's worth com contacting the accommodation team and letting them know um, so that they can try to um, accommodate you in an area where there would be an exercise area for the dog as well um, and there's obviously very specific things we, we would need to plan for like Alice said about labs and things um, but you know by the sounds of things um, you will find things generally okay for that I think it's just there's also about you know orientation training as well for you and for your dog um around the university which can be put in place before uh, you start great okay so um Eleanor says um she's considering starting university in 2022 um when should she contact disability services and begin applying for DSA? Well, we've got our um, open days this, this weekend for 2022. So I would say as soon as possible. So we would just encourage you to do that. You might find that services are very, very busy in the autumn, particularly, they're quite busy now, but I would say contact now anyway because the, soon, the sooner we know about you, the sooner we can start to help you plan and put things in place. Um, from the sort of library IT perspective, we can't really put anything specific in place until you've got an offer um, or really generally accept the offer. However, if you wanted to contact someone to say, what provision would you have? Um, because presumably you're, you're starting to look at different universities, that's absolutely fine. Um, so yeah, as Mo said, I, I, the, the DS, looking at the funding application and what evidence you might need, you might want to start sooner in terms of what we can practically do. Um, yeah, I mean, scoping it out, contacting us to see what we can do is, is absolutely fine. Great. Um, okay. Okay, so we've got a question around um, what happens if the student's need is above £25,000, so I'm talking about disabled students allowance, um, who picks up the rest of the bill, can the university help with this? I would be saying that's going to depend on, on what it is you need um, and, and on, you know, what's already in place as well at the universities that you want to go to, so I would be having conversations with the disability services departments because um, if it's going over your your DSA limits then they would be able to look at whether they can provide things whether there's other places that could potentially provide funding as well because there are some um, funds and uh, which tend to come from different charities and trusts which can help towards equipment as well um, but most most of the time um, the disability practitioners will be aware of the sorts of things that they can um, obtain funding for. And, you know, it's universities need to be considering individual cases as well. So 
the more time that we have to think about things like that and to start to plan, the better, um, because it can only make your experience smoother if you've got in touch with us earlier. Yeah, absolutely. And again, some departments have some funding to support access and inclusion as well. Um, so I know that um, some departments have bought specific bits of equipment or specific resources for individual students. Again, it's kind of case by case, um, but some of it I would think would be bought by the university. But again, it depends exactly what it is. It's, it's difficult to speak generally about that. So just kind of a follow up to that one. Um, Fonda also added that um, if the reasonable adjustments, um, if the university thinks the, you know, the reasonable adjustments cost too much, can they, re can they refuse the student? It comes down to a question of what is reasonable, which is, which is way broader in terms of debate than we can hope to address here. But I think, you know, if it's something you absolutely need, if it's something that will enable you to access your course, they will need to consider it. But it depends very much on, on what it is and, you know, how it is, you know, proportionate to, to other things that you need to access within the university. So I, I would say that's very complicated, but I would, I would talk to them. Universities do have a duty to provide reasonable adjustments, but the question is what that word reasonable applies to. And in each individual case, that can be slightly different. Yeah, absolutely. There are also things like the Disabled Students Commission um, and kind of student advocacy groups. So the student union at a university might be something to look at. There's usually disabled officers there. But again, as Mo said, it's, it's kind of what constitutes reasonable adjustment. Yeah. Um, so if there are problems in a department, um, so people like me and Mo might go and talk to somebody and say, well, actually, this is a reasonable adjustment. You need to do that. If it's a huge thing that's much more up for debate, that might go a bit wider. I mean, what, what is reasonable is, is quite a big question. Yeah. And just, just to come in and to say, say with that, when you go for your, your DSA assessment, they will be able to talk you through the equipment that they're recommending, the non-medical help that they're recommending. You'll be able to have that conversation with them. And if you do feel that that, they, that you are facing difficulties or that something's not being provided. Our student support service team is here as well, where we can talk you through your options and support you through conversations with your university and uh, the, the DSA process as well. So there's a lot of support out there, uh, but as both Alice and Mo have said, it really does depend because you, every student is individual in terms of how they use their site, the equipment that they use, and then it will vary from the course that you're studying in terms of what support and adjustments need to be put in place. You know, if you're studying archaeology, the support that's needed is really different if you're studying history to then if you're, you're studying a STEM subject. So there are so many variables, which is why it's so important, as Mo and Alice have said, to, to get in touch with your university as early as possible and to, to use the resources that are out there. Um, okay, guys, so um, Max says, do you apply for DSA through your choosing your own chosen university? You would apply through your student finance provider. So if you live in England, that would be Student Finance England. Um, uh, you know, same with Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. You would, you would apply to your student finance provider. And when you apply for student finance, so when you apply for your student loans, you can also apply for DSA. Obviously, you don't have to also apply for student loans if you don't want them. You can apply for the DSA funding, which is a grant and not a loan, um, through your, your local student finance provider. Um, I just don't know whether you guys will, will be able to help with this one, but um, we've had an anonymous person say, um, could you expand on how Oxford and Cambridge differ from other Russell Group universities? I'm so most of in terms of disability support. Sorry, sorry, yeah. Alice. I'm most acquainted with um, Cambridge, um, and I know that that they differ in terms of being able to cover a lot of the support themselves, rather than always relying on DSA. But they do also encourage you to apply for DSA. Um, and to, to explore that support in conjunction with them. 
Um, again, the same as any other university, please do get in touch with them as early as possible. And I think it's just a case of, you know, being able to talk to them. Um, I think, you know, they're in a unique position because they do have a lot of financial backing for uh, adjustments. And the, one of the re main things um, that creates a difference is that they work on a, a collegiate basis. York works as a collegiate university, but we work differently. We have central support services and central pots of money, whereas Oxford and Cambridge tend to arrange their finances differently. So it's often the individual college who would be funding adjustments. So it is very slightly different and it just adds an extra layer of, um, you know, uh, I won't say, I don't, wanted to, don't want to say complication. I think it's more about an extra layer of conversation between yourself and the disability practitioners and the college that you want to go to. Yeah, and, and just from the library IT side, I can't really talk very much to it because they are very different from the way the rest of us operate. So there are some national schemes around um, library visiting and things like that, obviously suspended currently because of COVID, but normally there would be and some of these reciprocal schemes. Oxford and Cambridge generally don't take part in any of those. So um, they, they have quite a different model. And again, uh, Mo mentioned the collegiate thing, they've got college libraries. It's a very different model of um, library and resource provision. Um, so it would be incredibly dependent on what you were studying and which college you were in. But again, as Mo said, there is quite a lot of money there. So it doesn't mean that just because they don't have the same kind of setup as everyone else that you wouldn't get the support. It's just provided in a very different way. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Um, so Lauren says, um, can you receive DSA even though you are already receiving personal independence payments? Yes, absolutely. And it doesn't have an impact um, on PIP and, and vice versa. Guys, can you see any other questions? I, th I think, is that it? Um, so it looks like we've yes, got- Yes, there are. Oh, sorry, Alice. Yes, there are a few, a, a few others that are coming through as well. Um, so do I automatically get special dispensation on completing coursework or in exams? Um, not automatically. Um, nothing, nothing really happens automatically, um, but- it would potentially, if it's something that you need, and if it's something that's considered a reasonable adjustment and people do have um, different kind of time lengths on exams, there are extensions for some people. If it's part of your student support plan that would be put in place when you start at university by the disability practitioner, officer, or whoever they are um, in that institution, then yes, you would have that built into your assessments. Um, at York, generally it's built into the assessments. If you then have something like you have to go into hospital or something, happens relating to your condition but isn't like an everyday thing there might be an extension um but yeah if they're built into your student support plan then absolutely brilliant excellent thank you we've got two more questions thank you everybody for all the questions that are coming through they've been fantastic um if you do think of any questions after this session there'll be an opportunity to to just get in, in touch with us and and Mo and Alice have said they're, they're happy to, to pick up anything if they're able to ad advise. So just uh, two more. So will it be up to the student to find the funding from outside, especially in terms of independent living support and the residential side? Okay, so in terms of, um, it depends, again, it often depends what it is. So in terms of independent living support, if we're talking about um, funding, PAs to help you get around, things like that. Um, we would be looking first to your social services in your local area and asking them to carry out an assessment because they would then be able to determine whether they would be able to provide any funding. Sometimes there is a contribution that you may have to make towards that support. And again, they, they do make judgments based on what is reasonable and if some of that isn't being covered, then it's a good idea to come and talk to disability practitioners or money advisors. We can look at the kinds of things that we might be able to do to support you and where that funding might come from. 
As I mentioned earlier, we can also look at things like universal credit, which can help towards the cost of your rent. Claiming as a student is not straightforward, but it is possible, but there's an additional process that you need to go through first. Um, so it's a case of talking to us about your situation. We would be able to, to advise you then on, on what you need to do. Um, in terms of accommodation, you, each university will have a slightly different system for this. A few years ago, DSA used to fund the difference between um, a standard accommodation and the more sort of high cost accommodation, such as a studio flat or an ensuite room that you might need because of a reasonable adjustment. And each university now will do something slightly different around that. At York, we do have some disability funding that we can provide to help meet the difference between the cost of a standard room and the room that you require. However, that will vary as to how much according to what kind of room you go for. Um, but you would still then get the universal credit if you've already got personal independence payment and you get assessed as having limited capability for work. So that would require a conversation really um, with a student advisor like myself um, or a disability practitioner. And if you're unsure where to go with that question, um, I'm sure our colleagues here would be able to help. And, and obviously you can also get in touch with me and I can direct you to somewhere in your local area as well. That's brilliant. There's a follow up. There's another question that's just come in, but it is a follow up. And um, just a clarification, when you mentioned local authority, do you mean the local authority from the parents' home or the local authority where the university is? Yeah, so it usually depends on, on where you're moving from rather than where you're moving to. So it would normally be social services in, local, in the local authority in the area you are. So if you were moving from, say, Hammersmith up to York and it would be the people in your local area who would be carrying out an assessment and providing the funding it might be up to you to actually find the support so sometimes they might ask you to find an agency um, or employ PAs in order to access the funding they're giving you or to use the funding they're giving you so again there might be some extra steps you need to take to do that um, at York I would be helpful able to help you with that other universities may have someone who can help with that as well lovely and the final question is that um i don't know if you're you're able to answer this one but dsa assessor has said that they cannot mention about the support of things like interveners for deaf blind students so where would that support sit oh now i'm i'm not completely sure about this um if if it's not something that's under DSA, um, it may be because that is something that they think you need anyway, um, regardless of study. So sometimes it can be something to do with that. Um, I think talking to the disability practitioners within a university is a really good idea. Um, sorry, Alice, did you have something to, to say on that? Yeah, I mean, just again, not that one specifically, as you say, it may be that they don't feel it falls under this sort of study aspect. I know some departments will employ people to do things like note take and things in mm. um, departments. So again, talking to your department, talking to you, um, the advisors available to you about what might be possible um, is, is definitely um, worthwhile with that. One thing I would just say about sort of you mentioned interveners there, there is at the moment a sort of trend away from paying people to note take or support and more reliance on providing people with assistive tech and assistive software. Um, and the idea being that that helps build independence, although sometimes the training or support or the speed of getting that stuff in place is not great. It's also, I think, sometimes we've, we've had some feedback that there's been a bit of a challenge that people have had um, a lot of sort of human provider support, as it were, in school or college, and then going to university, it's very much more giving somebody a lot of technical support, but then expecting them to, to manage that themselves. So um, there is kind of a shift more towards the technical rather than the human, I think, in, in the support provided at the moment. Um, certainly in terms of DSA funding, that's what we've sort of seen. 
um, and to some extent as well with, with kind of library provision. But again, talking to people at wherever you're planning to go um, about what they can provide, about what different departments can provide um, and, you know, having having those conversations. I know advocating for yourself and particularly at a time of big change is going to be difficult but there are people like Mo and me whose job it is and we want to help you and we want to see you succeed and we want to get you as much support as possible um, so please do come and talk to us I know that having to go and have more conversations when you're sorting out everything else is not necessarily what you'd want to do um, but there are people there to, to try and support with that I think um, I don't know what else to, to add to that Mo. Thank you. Um, uh, we we have five five minutes left. Thank you so much, Alice and Mo. I mean, it's been it's been brilliant. A really really interesting. Really lots of great questions. So thank you to all the participants for asking questions. We have been recording this session. It will go up on our, our website. We'll be um, sharing it. Um, by, so. bit more confident about what you need to do and, and able to, to, to go and get that support in place. I've just got a notice to say my internet connection is not stable, which is always brilliant when you're trying to deliver a webinar. But I just wanted to just give a, a little plug for our student support service. Um, we are here to support, advise, uh, provide guidance, link you in with, with others for anything that's related to post-16 education. We have a vast amount of resources on our web page. We have a Facebook group that's made up of students and professionals where people ask questions and other students can come in and answer. We run uh, webinars like this. So if there's another topic that you would like or you think Thomas Popkington should be running a webinar on, please let us know. And then, as I said, I've just popped in our chat our email address and we have a bespoke uh, service where we can provide that one-to-one -one information, advice, guidance and support. So thanks again to the brilliant panellists and for Alex for taking the helm with asking all the questions. Um, and I'd just like to wish you all the best of luck going forward with your university choices and with your results and, and those next steps. I hope you don't feel like you're going to be alone on that journey. So please do reach out to your university, reach out to our, our support service. And if you haven't already, contact um, the, the student loans company for whatever country you're in get your DSA application sorted. As I've said, it is, you don't have to pay it back. You know, it's a grant and it's brilliant support there, resources in terms of the equipment and non medical help support. It really does help students to, to be able to get the best out of their university experience. So thank you again for your time and the best of luck, everybody. And thank you again, Alice and Mo, it's been brilliant.